This conference will now be recorded. Good evening, students. I'm Dr. Divya from T9 State. Now we are learning 12th chapter, Biotechnology and its Application, Part 3. And this is the last class of this chapter. And so far in this chapter, we have learned about different biotechnological applications. And we learned about by using microbes and plants, animals and all and by using their metabolic machinery. By studying all these things, biotechnology has given several useful products. Right? We have learned in this chapter itself, we have learned about different techniques and applications of biotechnology. And through genetic engineering, engineer through genetic engineering of microbes, then plants, animals, And then through recombinant DNA technology, all these biotechnological applications, they made possible, right? Continuous researches are now going on in this field, biotechnological field, because we need more food, medicine, everything. So for large scale production, they are depending upon the biotechnological applications. So they have learn more about recombinant DNA technology and they applied that in different fields. So generally using these techniques like recombinant DNA technology and genetically modified organism, they have created a new world, right? So by applying this RDNA technology, genetically modified organisms have been created and by using these methods, like other than this natural method to transfer one more one or more than one genes from one organism to another organism. For all these techniques, they are depending upon biotechnological applications, right? Through RDNA technology, transferring of gene or more than one gene. Now all those things are possible. Then increasing in crop yield, right? And the major issues of crop that is yield reduction. So they are increasing by scientists. Scientists are continuously doing researches for increasing the yield. For yield, yield increasing, they are doing continuous researches. They need more productivity, right? Each plant should give more yield because nowadays, whatever the production level is not enough to feed this population. So to increase the yield, then another issue is post-harvest yield flows. So whatever we yield we are getting post -har after harvesting, the storage is an issue and pest and insects as issues are there. So after harvesting, different kind of losses are there. To make, to make up that crop more tolerant, stress tolerance, then what is that disease or disease tolerance or herbicide tolerant one, then water use efficiency, to increase the water use efficiency and all different kinds of researches are going on. So genetically modified plants, they made genetically modified plants to survive from all these situations. So today there are large number of genetically modified crop plants and that have improved the nutritional value of food and Without depending upon the herbicide, herbicide or insecticide, they are able to give a very good yield. See, you know that in the starting class itself, herbicide resistant, herbicide tolerant onion here in this, in this first page itself, you can see the picture like this. So that and all shows without depending on chemicals or pesticides, 
crops are giving very good yield and they are able to withstand the post harvest yield loss so such kind of researches are going on these are all coming under biotechnological applications pest resistant crops and the develop then by uh, enabling the mass production of safe and more what we can say more effective effective therapeutics then recombinant dna technology that have made very good impact in the area of health care it is giving very good impact because you know nowadays medicines are available for everything almost all diseases there is treatment medicines are available compared to earlier time now it's very easy to get treatment right medicines are available it's very common like we are doing the can treatment for cancer then such kind of diseases aids so for everything treatments are available nowadays so biotechnological application even we can say the covid vaccine that is a biotechnological application the development of different kinds of vaccine So in the area of healthcare also, recombinant DNA technology is having very good impact. Then what we can say another one, what and all we have studied in this chapter. Another thing is from uh, human and non -hum from non-human sources, different kinds of product are getting isolated, right? Like we learned about insulin and all. So recombinant therapeutics. that in that field different non-human source from non-human sources all different products are isolated which are similar to human products like human proteins and all like that medical field is growing day by day so identical to human protein non-human uh, products like from non-human sources also same similar types of products are getting isolated and these products, when we are using that, that is not at all inducing any unwanted immunological response. Like any, it's not creating any kind of allergy or any kind of difficulties in the patients. And they are free, free from infection. That means they are not at all creating any kind of infection also. So uh, the products which are almost identical, or they are almost identical, the structure of that product which we are uh, uh, selecting from the, or we are isolating from the non-human sources. So that structure of such products are almost similar. It is almost similar to the same product which we want. So it is almost identical to the natural product. For this, we can say example insulin. Insulin, that part we have already learned. Insulin, which is used for Diabetes. Then, then contribution, how genes are influencing a disease, how genes are contributing towards a disease. So that, that also we know like cancer, cystic fibrosis, rheumatoid arthritis, Alzheimer's, then all these, all these such kind of disease. This is passing through genes. So how it is getting treated? Insertion of genes into an individual, individual or individual cell or tissue, as cell in cell or tissue, and it is getting treated. That it is getting treated, and that it's getting cured in the starting stages, like hereditary diseases, like. Uh, some kind of hereditary diseases and or what we will do through gene therapy, we can cure that. So the process, the process includes replacing of that gene, which is in defective form or that mutant allele that is replacing and a proper gene or a good gene, which is a functional gene. 
that one is getting inserted or that mutant gene or that defective gene is getting replaced by a functional gene so like this we can transfer healthy genes or in one point or more than one point uh, one portion of that gene itself we can do that so for that purpose vectors we are using vectors so vectors will help to transfer this gene into a host organism right through different technologies so all these all these things serious ethical issues have been raised because of this manipulation of genes and all microbes plants and animals everything everything is getting manipulated so these have been questioned because this genetic modifications are being questioned so that one we are going to learn today then before that molecular diagnosis that part also we need to leave by Uh, biotechnological application in medicine in that molecular diagnosis that one we'll learn first see all these pcr techniques and all we have already discussed in previous chapters so first let us go for molecular diagnosis see when we are getting a disease first we need to diagnose that if you are diagnosing that in an early stage it will be very easy to cure or that won't damage the body much right so early diagnosis and understanding first thing when we are getting a disease first thing is early diagnosis then understanding understanding pathophysiology that is very important right we should know the nature we should know the nature of that infecting organism right we should know about the pathogen we should have a clear idea about the pathogen which is infecting our body so we need to know in early stage for a better treatment and we should have a very good idea about the pathogen so early diagnosis and understanding its pathophysiology that is very important for effective treatment of a disease then if we have very good idea about the pathogen and at early stage we are diagnosing means it will be easy it will be easy for treating that disease right so early detection it's it's comparatively difficult like in normal diseases and all it's easy right but when the diseases are some some kind of serious diseases are coming means that time this early diagnosis is very very difficult we cannot find out through blood test or urine test and all we can we cannot find out that analysis through urine analysis or serum analysis and all is very difficult so detection is not possible using conventional method of diagnosis conventional method in the sense through blood test or urine test and all urine sample or blood sample that uh, by testing those things we can make out the nature of that disease or we can't find out the pathogen so some kind of techniques are there so those techniques are helping us to diagnose the diseases some kind of serious diseases right so some techniques that that is especially for the early diagnosis and recombinant dna technology polymerase chain reaction then enzyme linked immunosorbent assay that is elisa they are the techniques some kind of techniques that are helping for early diagnosis rdna technology you know that we have already told how this rdna technology is helping then polymerase chain reaction we have discussed in previous chapters and enzyme linked immunosorbent assay so all these techniques they are helping for early detection okay so when that pathogen that is producing a disease symptom like if it is present the pathogen is present like bacteria or virus something is present it is normally we will get a we will get suspected like uh, that pathogen is there in our body we will get an idea because it is showing some kind of disease symptom 
right? When pathogen, one pathogen like virus or bacteria, something is entering inside our body, it will show some kind of symptoms. So, patients or uh, when we are diagnosing that things, we'll get an idea. Yeah, it's there. Some kind of infection is there in our body. When it is a bacterial infection or viral infection, it is producing some kind of symptoms and we can make out very easily that some disease, some kind of disease, it is there and we are not feeling well. Like that feelings will come or that kind of symptoms body will show. Right? But when it is showing that symptom, by that time, by that time, what will happen? That pathogen, concentration of that pathogen in the body, it will be very, very high. Right? So we need an early detection method. We need to, in the starting stage itself, we should be able to detect. So by the amplification, amplification of the nucleic acid, by PCR, polymerized chain reaction, that is for amplification. So in, if you are applying PCR technology and all, it's in very low concentration of bacteria or virus, whatever may be at the time of that symptom, that won't be visible. So in such an early state, we can find out with the help of PCR, polymerized chain reaction, when that bacteria or virus, when it is infected, before showing symptom, when it is showing symptom, the concentration of that pathogen will be very high in our body. So before that stage itself, we can identify or we can detect by uh, with the help of polymerized chain reaction. Because very low concentration of bacteria that will be amplified with the help of PCR. In uh, like if you are if you have any suspected patients like AIDS, that kind of disease. In that, PCR is being used for the detection of HIV. In suspected AIDS patients, PCR is used for the detection. HIV detection, PCR is being used. So uh, then cancer patients also, we are using what? Same PCR technology for what? The detection of mutant genes. Find out the mutant genes in cancer patients also. PCR technology is being used. Then PCR nowadays it's becoming very powerful tool for the detection because in very early stage or in the starting stage itself when the pathogen concentration is very low in the body, that time itself if the, uh, there is a suspected patient we can take the sample and we can go for PCR technique. When the, in PCR, what it will do, polymerized chain reaction, that sample will get amplified or the DNA or the sample which is collected that will get amplified and from that we can make out which kind of disease or what disease is there or what, uh, what is getting or what kind of infection is there in our body that we can make out with the help of this PCR in very early stage. This is an early diagnosis. Okay. If you are waiting for a symptom, then by that time, our body will get complete infection or the concentration of that pathogen will be very high and it will be difficult for the treatment. Right. That time, chances will be very less. So when we are detecting in the early stage, the chance for curing that disease, that will be very high. Right? So for the effective treatment of disease, early diagnosis and understanding its pathophysiology is very important. Recombinant DNA technology, then polymerized chain reaction, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, ELISA. These are some of the techniques that serves us, that serve the purpose of early diagnosis. Then the presence of pathogen like bacteria, viral pathogen and all normally suspected only when the pathogen has produced a disease symptom. That time only we will get a hint like some kind of infection is there in our body. Right? When bacteria or virus when it is there, when it is producing a 
this is symptom then only we will get a hint like it is present the pathogens are present in our body so by that time the concentration of pathogen is already high in the body so however very low concentration of a bacteria or virus that can be detected by amplification of their nucleic acid by pcr okay that nucleic acid when we are collecting the sample and going for pcr the nucleic acid of that virus or bacteria that will get amplified and it is very easy to diagnose in the early stage so pcr that is now routinely used to detect hiv in suspected aids patient so in suspected aids aids patient pcr is used for the detection it's being used to detect mutation in genes in suspected cancer patients too gene mutation in cancer patient to detect that also pcr is being used and it's a powerful technique to identify many other genetic disorder so it's a powerful technique we can detect many genetic disorders with the help of pcr then So PCR is nothing but polymerase chain reaction. It's a chain of reactions. So PCR, PCR, the expansion is polymerase chain reaction. Here PCR or polymerase chain reaction, it's a technique and it's used in molecular biology. Once again, I'm explaining the PCR. Or polymerase chain reaction in detail because this is very important. You should have an idea about this. You should get complete idea about this because this question will come for your board exam as well as for your NEET exam. This different components of PCR, then uh, principle of PCR. Types of PCR, then steps of PCR, their application level. From all these, you can expect descriptive type question as well as MCQ. Okay, so this is an important topic. Already we have discussed in previous chapter, but once again I'm explaining to understand how it is getting applied in biotechnology field or what is the use of PCR in this field or molecular. Diagnosis, how it is related to PCR. Okay. So these and all helping for molecular level diagnosis. Molecular level in the sense when we will use that term molecular level, when it is going to DNA or RNA, when it is going to nuclear level, that molecular level diagnosis we are doing. Okay. So PCR or polymerase chain reaction, that is the technique used in molecular biology. Okay, this is coming in molecular biology and this PCR is helping to create several copies of DNA segment. Okay, we'll collect a very little sample from that we can make up. That is getting amplified and it is making several copies of DNA segment. So first in 1983, this technique was developed, this PCR technique was developed and it is developed by an American biochemist, Carrie Bank Mullis. This and all we have discussed. So Carrie Bank Mullis in 1983, he developed, he is a biochemist from America and he developed this technology. So through PCR, we can generate million of copies of small DNA segments. So this tool, it is mainly used in biotechnology labs for molecular level diagnosis. Okay. Then what is the principle of PCR or how on what basis, based on which principle this PCR is working? So PCR technique, it is based on actually it is an enzymatic replication of DNA. You know that PCR is mainly it is an enzymatic replication of DNA. 
DNA. This is the PCR machine. We'll make a cocktail. We'll say, uh, we'll tell that as cocktail. So how we'll make that cocktail in one polymerase chain reaction tube? This is a PCR tube. In this tube, we'll make, we'll mix all these like nucleotide, primer, DNA sample, tag polymerase, buffer, everything will mix. And that mix, that is called as cocktail. And this we will set, we can set the program in this PCR machine and we can keep it depending upon how we need the result. Based on that, we can arrange the program. We can set the program and we can keep it for the reaction. So I'll explain how we will do that. So DNA here, the PCR technique, mainly it is based on enzymatic replication of DNA. Then in PCR, short segment of DNA is amplified. Okay. The short segment of here, you can see the short DNA, that sample or that segment is getting amplified with the help of primer. Then DNA polymerase, then here nucleotide, then buffer, all these things. With the help of all these, the DNA sample is getting amplified. So in PCR, that short segment or very small segment of DNA is getting amplified using primer mediated enzyme. Then DNA polymerase, DNA polymerase, that is Synthesizing new strands of DNA. Okay, DNA polymerase enzyme, the stack polymerase that is helping for the synthesis of new strands of DNA. And these new strands that will be complementary to the template strand. Okay, that strands will be newly synthesized strands will be uh, complementary to the template strand. Okay, then that DNA polymerase that is having another work and that can add a nucleotide to the OH group. Okay, that you can't understand now. See the structure of DNA, you should keep that in mind. To that 3 dash N, 3 dash N OH group will be present. 3 dash and 5 dash ends of DNA, you know that. So at that 3 dash N OH group, this will add nucleotide. Okay, therefore, we need a primer. We need a primer. So to the 3 dash prime, more nucleotides will get added. Then, so based on this principle, so what is the principle? It is mainly a short segment of DNA is getting amplified by using primer mediated enzyme. In this, nucleotides will be provided TAC polymerase, DNA polymerase enzyme will be provided with the help of that primer, nucleotide, TAC polymerase and all. This DNA sample will get amplified. That is the principle behind PCR. Okay. So next, which are the components of PCR? Note down, which are the components of PCR? DNA template. We need a DNA sample. That is called a DNA template. Then DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase, this stack polymerase, this is the DNA polymerizing enzyme. Then oligonucleotide, these nucleotides, which is giving nucleotide A, T, G, C, and all that is providing. And with the help, it is this nucleotide. They are the components of PCR. With the help of this, new strands are getting synthesized. Then deoxyribonucleotide triphosphate. That means D deoxy ribonucleotide triphosphate. Then buffer system. Here you can see the buffer. A buffer is also needed for the reaction. Okay, that reaction buffer is also there. Then so these are the components. Which are the components? DNA template. This DNA template means which DNA we want to. Amplified that is called as DNA template that we can call as DNA template that DNA we want to amplify that is the DNA of interest or the sample which we are which we need for amplification or that is the DNA of interest which you need to get amplified. Next is DNA polymerase. 
So mainly tag polymerase is used and this tag polymerase, what is the importance of tag polymerase or how, why we are selecting tag polymerase? What is the reason for selecting tag polymerase for this? So DNA polymerase here, DNA polymerase, which one is using? Tag polymerase. That tag polymerase, it is thermostable and at very high temperature also it won't get denatured. That is the importance. Tag polymerase, this is thermostable and because during PCR to unwind that DNA, to make it single stranded, we need to break the bond between that, right? Means this denaturation, that step. Here you can see the double stranded DNA. This is the DNA and it is double stranded. See, here you can see it is getting attached here in the middle, right? So that bond we need to break. Then each strand, each strand is acting as a template strand. Means this strand will get separated and the down this strand also will get separated. Then each strand will act as a parental strand. And a new strand is getting synthesized, which is complementary, which is complementary to the parental strand or the template strand. Okay. For that, the DNTP, this nucleotides will give, it is provided here. Then buffer is there, tag polymerized is there. So at high temperature here, you can see 95 degrees centigrade, that strand will get separated. That is called as denaturation. So the DNA strands will get separated at 95 degree centigrade. That is actually a high, very high temperature, 95 degree. You know that 95 degree, it is a high temperature. So at that temperature, this DNA polymerase enzyme, enzyme should not get degraded. Right? If it is not working at high temperature, this process is involved. Get completed, it won't get separated this DNA strands and all. So for that purpose, we need a thermostable enzyme, right? So the DNA polymerase, tag polymerase is used and it is thermostable and it won't get denatured at very high temperature. Then which is the next one? Oligonucleotide primers. Oligonucleotide primers. So this oligonucleotide primers are, they have the short structure of single-stranded DNA complementary to the three dash end of sense and antisense strands. Okay, oligonucleotide primers. These primers, primers are small DNA strands or small stretch of DNA. This will be, and these primers, they are single-stranded. Okay, they'll be complementary to the three dash end. Okay, next is deoxyribonucleotide triphosphate. What is the role of deoxyribonucleotide triphosphate? This is providing energy for polymerization. Next command is deoxyribonucleotide triphosphate. This is giving energy. Okay, this is the energy providing component. For what purpose? For polymerization. And they are the building blocks for the synthesis of DNA. They are the building blocks. They are providing these nucleotides. So they are the building blocks for the DNA synthesis. And you know that these are single unit bases. A, T, G, C and all single unit bases. These are the building blocks and that is providing energy for the synthesis. Next is buffer system. The last one, mixed buffer. This is the buffer in buffer system. Here, magnesium, then potassium. These magnesium and potassium, both are helping for denaturation and after that, reunion of this DNA. Here, denaturation, it is getting separated. Then after that, renaturation. Again, for joining. For that purpose, also, this magnesium and potassium, they are helping for denaturation and renaturation. So, and for the activity of this tag polymerase or the DNA polymerase enzyme, both are very important. What buffer system is very important and for stability. For stability also, it is very important.
okay that buffer system so it is helping for the dna polymerase activity then the uh, magnesium and potassium that is providing maximum optimum condition for dna denaturation and renaturation then it's important for tag polymerase activity also okay then then you can see different types of pcr this different types of pcr are all important for your neat exam so different types of pcr which are they nested pcr multiplex pcr quantitative pcr arbitrary prime pcr so these are different types of pcr nested pcr means in nested pcr what you can see there is a specificity only specific part it will go and bind only that specific part will get amplified in the nested pcr okay so there won't be that this primer will go and bind in some regions or some places so here the primary primer binding site that will be exact it won't go and bind here and there and there will be a specificity in primer binding also and next is just note down this point that's enough no need to study in detail because in higher class only this will come this nested pcr multiplex pcr and all in higher classes only you can study in detail now there is it's not necessary just to know nested pcr that is specificity in nested pcr what what is that specificity at the exact point it will go and bind the primer specificity will be there then real time pcr in real in real time pcr with the help of a fluorescent reporter that uh, dna amplification is getting detected okay real time pcr means in that dna amplification is getting detected in real time with the help of a fluorescent reporter okay that fluorescent reporter the strength of that fluorescent reporter that will be equal or that is consider or it is directly proportional to the amplified dna molecule if the uh, that fluorescent reporter that is less means there is very less amplified dna molecule if it is more means the amplified dna molecule will be more in like that it is directly proportional okay then in nested pcr what we said this is for the improvement of sensitivity and specificity will be more in this okay non specific binding will be very less so non specific binding of products that will be very less in this you can see specificity in nested pcr next is multiplex pcr in multiplex pcr multiple targets multiple target regions in a single pcr experiment itself you can target multiple places or multiple uh, targeted genes can be amplified in this multiplex pcr so many different dna sequences you can amplify simultaneously that is the speciality of multiplex pcr then another type is quantitative pcr what is quantitative pcr see suppose we have a non sequence so for quantifying that non sequence only that particular one is getting amplified we need the quantification of that particular sequence so for only that will get amplified and uh, we can that uh, that is helping for the quantification of that particular sequence then arbitrary primed pcr that is the last one here arbitrary primed pcr in arbitrary prime pcr that is actually dna fingerprinting technique it's a type of dna fingerprinting technique and it's based on this pcr technology and here arbitrary primers are used other in other pcr technologies and all that is there will be specific primers which will be almost matching with this but here arbitrary primers are being used okay 
10 different steps. Next one we want to learn PCR steps. Different steps of PCR. Different steps are denaturation. Here you can see first step denaturation. Then annealing. Second step is annealing. Third step is elongation or extension. Elongation or extension. First is denaturation, then annealing, then extension. Denaturation, annealing. Extension of elongation. These are the three steps. In denaturation, what we are doing? Denaturation means that mixture. I said all, by mixing all these things, we will prepare a cocktail that will be kept inside this PCR machine and that will be heated. That cocktail or that reaction mixture that will get heated to 94 degrees centigrade and we will keep it for 2 minutes, maximum 2 minutes. So that is breaking. In that step, it is breaking. In high temperature, it is breaking the hydrogen bonds between two strands. Okay, this PCR already we have learned. So just to remind you once again, I'm explaining all these things because you should not get confused. So it is breaking in high temperature. What is happening there? The hydrogen bonds between two strands of DNA. It is getting or those those are broken now within that high temperature. So after breaking these hydrogen bonds, that two strands of DNA it is getting separated. Now these are independent strands. Strands are getting, becoming independent or they are getting separated. Okay. So they, that it is getting converted into single-stranded DNA. Then these single-stranded DNA or that is now acting as a template for the production of new strands. Single strand which is getting separated that will act as a template strand for the production of new strands of DNA and that temperature 95 that will be provided for the complete separation until and unless it is getting completed that temperature will be the same. Then second step now denaturation over second step is annealing. So in this step in this step annealing step the temperature will be around 50, 55 to or 54 to 60 degree. Okay. That will be 50 to 60. In that range only annealing will take place. And we'll keep it for 20 to 40 seconds. And all here, the primer, the primer which we are providing here, primer, small stretch of DNA, that will bind to the complementary sequence on the template DNA. Okay. Here, the template DNA, DNA is getting separated, then annealing, annealing of this primers, primer annealing step. That is the complete name, full name or complete title of that step. Primer annealing, primer is getting attached to the exact point and that makes the complementary strands or that is helping for the synthesis of complementary strands. So, the primers, they are single-stranded DNA or single-stranded RNA that will be having around 20 to 30 bases. Okay. That is helping in the synthesis of complementary strands. And these primers are the starting point of complementary strand synthesis. Okay. Primers, they are small stretch of DNA. They will be having around 20 to 30 uh, bases. And that will be the starting point of the uh, complementary strand synthesis. Okay. Then... Next is elongation. Elongation is the third step. Elongation or extension. Elongation means in this step, again the temperature now 50 to 60, primer annealing step. Okay. Then after that again temperature is raised to 72 to 80 degree. This is in this step, uh, that primer at the end of that the basis which we are providing here basis nucleotide that will be added to this and elongation of this dna dna in the 5 dash to 3 dash direction now primer is annealed then dntp the nucleotides are getting provided and after that elongation this dna strands which will get elongated in 5 dash to 3 dash direction. Then that DNA polymerase that will be added. 
Now a complete stretch is there. Now DNA polymerase is getting added to this condition, and the TAC polymerase that can tolerate. We know that that is temperature tolerant, and that is can tolerate very high temperature. Then it is getting attached to the primer, and that is adding DNA to the single strand. Sorry, DNA bases to the single strand. So as a result of all these things, you can see a double stranded DNA. And again, these steps will get repeated. This DNA expression now one complete strand is formed. Again, temperature will increase. It will go to ninety five. These steps will repeat. Then this two strands which are synthesized newly, these two strands will get separated. Then you will get four single stranded DNA. Right, template strand will come. Again, the process will re repeat. Primer annealing step will work. Then primer annealing means this. Small stretch of these primers will get attached in all these four four template strands. Right? Then again, it will form the double stranded DNA after the synthesis or after the reaction, like elongation, and it will take place. Now, four you will get four double stranded DNA. So it is doubling. One will become two, two will become four, four will become eight, like that. When it is getting separated, the it will act as two parallel strand, and one new strand will synthesize. Again, these two strands again it will get denatured and it will become four single stranded template. For these four single stranded template, again new strands will get synthesized. Or uh, synthesis, uh, synthesizing of new strand is taking place and it is forming A. So it's becoming double. Okay. Then it in which channel? So that's all about PCR reaction, denaturation, annealing, then extension. Then this process which is getting repeated for another 20 to 40 times. So based on that repeating or repetition number of repeating reactions will get the quantity. The sequence of DNA of interest will get multiplied or that quantity will increase or it is getting amplified in polymerase chain reaction. Then in application level, what level you can see medicinal level, PCR is having application, forensic level, then in research and genetics, all this level you have PCR applications. In medicinal level, what we can see, disease causing genes in parents that we can detect. Then in gene therapy, monitoring we can do with the help of PCR. Genetic diseases like mutations and gene mutations and all we can find it with the help of PCR. In forensic science, genetic fingerprinting that we can do that in forensic science, the important thing is fingerprinting. And we can identify the criminal, right? With the help of this, we can identify from million of people. We can identify from the suspect, all suspected people. We can find out the criminal with the help of this. Then paternity test. Paternity test can be done with the help of this PCR. Then in genetic field and all, in genomic level studies, we can conduct, we can compare the genome of two organisms. Then gene expression. In which level gene expression is there that we can find out with the help of uh, PCR. Then for gene mapping, we can map the gene. Then phylogenetic level analysis, phylogenetic relationship of this organism that we can find out. In DNA level, we can find out from fossil studies and all we can conduct with the help of this PCR. So the PCR, it is having very high impact in molecular level diagnosis or in the biotechnological application in medicinal field or medical field. In medical field, it is having very high impact. Okay. Then, next what we can say is, another one is ELISA. Elisa, that is basically immunological technique. Okay, that is some basic assay technique. It is enzyme linked immunosorbent assay that is also called as Elisa, immuno enzyme, enzyme immunoassay. Enzyme linked immunosorbent assay, that is the 
expansion of ELISA. And uh, this is mainly done for the detection of antibodies, then hormones, peptides, proteins, and all in blood. In blood, we can find out the antibody, hormone, then peptide, protein, and all. So antibodies. So uh, you know that in our body, antibody for specific antigen, antibodies are getting produced. Okay, so that is helping to examine the presence of antibody in the body. So in some kind of infectious diseases and all, we can find out, we can detect the antibody. In our body, antibodies are getting produced. That we can detect with the help of ELISA. So compared to other antibody tests and all, uh, we can, it is easy. ELISA is, it, through ELISA we can distinguish that antibody or that is antibody assay and that is giving some quantitative result. Okay. For specific and non-specific reactions, it is giving result. And different types of ELISA are that is uh, See, only this much you need to study for your board exam. What is ELISA? Enzyme-linked immunosorbent as a immunological level experiment. That is an immunosorbent as a immunological level experiment. When our body is producing antibody towards an antigen, that, that can be detected. Okay. So, detection of that antibody. Here you can see enzyme labeled detection of antibody. That is done with the help of ELISA. So, there are different types of ELISA, indirect ELISA, sandwich ELISA, commutative ELISA, which are the indirect ELISA, sandwich ELISA, and commutative ELISA. Okay. So, this ELISA mainly it is working on the principle of specific antibodies that is binding the target antigen and detecting the presence of that quantity, that quantity of that antibody of antigen binding. So, in order to uh, increase that sensitivity, what we will do? That plate, we are doing in a plate. So, that plate will be coated with antibodies. Okay. Antibodies which, is, which are having high affinity, that will be coated. Then, antigen antibody concentration, that only we are analyzing in this ELISA. Okay. So, which are all diseases we can uh, detect with the help of the ELISA? Rotavirus, then syphilis, Ebola, then carcinoma of epithelial cells. All these things can be detected with the help of ELISA. Okay, so nothing to study in detail, that much only in the case of ELISA and PCR. PCR, you have already there, it's there in another chapter also. So you have to learn that in detail, the principle and different types of PCR, components of PCR and all. Then next is transgenic animals. Animals that have had their DNA manipulated to possess and express an extra gene. They are known as transgenic animals. Okay. Here, transgenic transgenic animals and transgenic plants and all. What do you know about this transgenic animals and all? There, a foreign gene is getting introduced into another organism. That is transgenic animal or plant. That is a foreign gene. A foreign, a different gene or a foreign gene is getting introduced into that animal. Then, Different types of transgenic animals are there like transgenic rat, rabbit, pig, sheep, cow, fish, all this already produced. So 95% of all existing transgenic animals. Then, How can we 
get the benefit of this modification or what and all why all these animals are being produced for what purpose we are producing this transgenic animals or how man is getting benefited with the help of this kind of modification or what is the use of this transgenic animal for normal physiology and development in this under this what we can say normal physiology and development what is that like to study how the genes if one gene a foreign gene is introduced into an organism that is called as transgenic animal or in that organism how that gene is getting regulated or how the activity of that gene is taking place or the normal function what are all functions that gene is doing in a normal body and for the development of that body how it is contributing what is the contribution of that gene to study that see for complex factors which are involved in the growth in the production of insulin insulin like growth factor in the production of that how a gene is getting con uh, giving the contribution so for such things transgenic animals are used or they are designed for that for the study of the function of a gene or the regulation of a gene or the fun uh, proper functioning and the changes which is making in the body okay so when a gene is introduced from other species you know when uh, one gene is getting introduced into a organism an organism from other species so that is creating so many alterations or that is uh, creating biological effects and we can study in this transgenic organism we can study such kind of effects and the data we can collect and we can do such research as the effect of different genes in the body of an organism then study of diseases different kind of diseases with the help of this transgenic animals we can do we can uh, conduct different kind of uh, researches uh, about the diseases and we can investigate the treatment for such kind of diseases right that is possible like human diseases like cancer then uh, rheumatoid arthritis alzheimers and all with the help of this transgenic animals we can study and we can find out a treatment method for that next is biological products biological products in the sense like insulin and all you know how it is developed with the help of bacteria so some medicines are used for the treatment of some specific human disease and right? that is having some biological products so these biological products are just very difficult or it will be costly to produce so such products which is available uh, which can uh, we can make it available with the help of this transgenic animals we can introduce that gene into this animals or this organism and with low cost we can make huge amount of that or large quantity of that particular product so insulin is an example for that then vaccine safety vaccine safety for see nowadays new vaccines are getting developed so first itself we can't try that in human so uh, this transgenic mice and all it's being developed and to test the efficiency and the safety of that vaccine first we are using almost for all experiment we are using transgenic mice okay directly we can test that in human being right so first we are using that on transgenic mice and different batches of vaccines are getting produced and each batch it is uh, the trial experiment will be done in such kind of transgenic animals like mice then chemical safety testing then toxicity or safety testing it is done in this kind of transgenic animals that drugs or that medicine that when it is getting produced that toxicity the level of toxicity and the test or the, the safety test which is done in transgenic animals so for that we are using these kind of models this model transgenic animals are used okay then several ethical issues are there for producing such kind of animals and all so manipulation of living organism by human 
human race that cannot go on any further without regulation so we can't manipulate gene manipulation is uh, actually it cannot be done for long way because some ethical standards are required for the evaluation so we need to take permission for all these things so genetic modification of organism that have unpredictable results genetic modif modification continuously it is going on means that may create serious issues also so we can't allow that for all type of organism and for all kind of trials so such organisms are introduced into ecosystem means that may create different serious issue so that should be protected that um, or prevented so to prevent that the indian government has set up organization there is specific organization as like geac genetic engineering approval committee so we need to take the approval which that is making the decision regarding the genetic modification researches and safety of introducing genetically modified organism for public service for public service like this medicinal trial or drug safety or that toxicity uh, trial and all for that and all we need to take permission first for the genetically modified organism on that organism on specific gene we need to try this medicine means uh, to introduce genetically uh, that gene should be introduced into such organism genetically modified organism with specific gene so we want to study that for that and all we need to take permission so for that the agencies are there government has set up organization like geac genetic engineering approval committee without the permission we can't do anything we need to take the permission for genetic modification then biopiracy is a term used to refer to the use of bio resources by multinational companies and other organizations without proper authorization from countries and people concerned without compensatory compensatory payment so biopiracy that is the term used to refer to use of bio resources by multinational companies okay biopiracy that is called as biopiracy so without the permission if you are using that will become legal issues and we need to take permission for genetic modification and to conduct such kind of experiment we need to take permission from genetic engineering approval committee so genetic modification of organism if you are doing more uh, modification that will create unpredictable issues or that may create dangerous issue situations in the case of organism okay so that and all have ethical issues also so that's all we have to learn in this chapter i hope everything is clear so if you have any doubt you can ask me in the next class Thank you. Thank you.